The attack this afternoon on a playground in Kharkiv, which claimed the life of a 14-year-old girl, injured 77 others, is a stark reminder of the brutality and the indiscriminate nature of the Russian attack on Ukraine. This attack, which targeted a civilian area with no military significance at all, exemplifies what Ukrainian officials and international observers have repeatedly described as a campaign of terror by the Kremlin aimed at demoralizing the Ukrainian population, breaking their will to resist, destroying uh, basic power lines, basic electricity, basic uh, supplies of water and so on in the um, in the roll up to the winter. This is a this is a um, a system that Putin and the Kremlin have devised and have played out every year since the conflict began. Kharkiv, a city that has suffered frequent bombardment since Russia's invasion in February 2022, lies perilously close to the Russian border. The use of guided bombs in a residential area leading to the destruction of a 12-storey building and significant civilian casualties underscores the deliberate targeting of non-combatants. And the regional head, uh, Oleg uh, Sinehubov's remarks about the attack being a form of mass terror against the civilian population are absolutely apt. The horror of such acts is compounded by the frequency and the apparent impunity with which they're carried out. And President Zelensky's renewed calls for Ukraine's international parties to allow it to strike targets within Russia reflects the growing frustration in Kyiv. Zelensky argues that the capability to preemptively strike the Russian military assets before they launch their bombs, their missiles, would be a legitimate and necessary measure to protect Ukrainian citizens. And this position, while understandable from a defensive standpoint, places Ukraine's Western allies in a difficult um, position. The fear of escalation, particularly involving NATO directly in the conflict, uh, has demanded a more cautious approach with many countries limiting the use of the weapons that they supply to just Ukraine, just protecting Ukrainian territory. And the international community's response to these attacks has been to condemn them as war crimes, as articulated by uh, um, the US Ambassador Bridget Brink. However, condemnation alone does little to prevent these atrocities. And the dilemma facing Ukraine and its allies is whether to continue with the current strategy of defensive support or to take the more aggressive step of enabling Ukraine to strike deeper into Russian territory, potentially deterring future attacks, but risking a broader escalation of the conflict. Now, of course, part of the solution to this may already be staring us in the face because Ukraine is developing its own missiles. And Zelensky's dismissal of General Oleschuk, the head of Ukraine's air force, shortly after the attack, adds another layer of complexity to the situation. And while the reasons for his decision remain unclear, it signals a possible shift in Ukraine's military strategy or a response to internal pressures regarding the effectiveness of air defense measures, particularly as, a, as an F-16 was downed yesterday. The timing of this dismissal following uh, the major drone attack and the ongoing challenges in defending Ukraine against Russian air and missile strikes suggests a critical reassessment of Ukraine's military leadership and capabilities. In the broader context of this conflict, including Ukraine's limited incursions into Russian territory, such as the Kursk Oblast and the ongoing drone strikes within Russia, getting even as far as Moscow itself, highlights the evolving nature of the war. Ukraine's ability to project power beyond its borders, even in limited fashion, is a significant shift in the dynamics of the conflict. Yet these actions also underscore the high stakes involved as each escalation carries the risk of further intensifying the war and potentially dragging Eastern Europe into a nuclear conflict. Or actually the entire world. The tragic events in Kharkiv illustrate the brutal reality of the war in Ukraine, the difficult decisions facing its leaders and international supporters, and the attack on a playground, the civilian casualties, the broader strategic implications all point to a conflict that is far from resolved.
and far from any potential resolution. The international community needs to grapple with the ethical, the strategic and the diplomatic challenges of how best to support Ukraine and negotiate with Russia to A, avoid a catastrophic escalation, B, de-escalate and push towards peace, a balance that becomes ever more precarious with each passing day, a balance which becomes ever more brutal as the diplomatic silence deepens. We need to be engaged in conversations. We are not at war with Russia. But Russia is behaving so badly. We need to reach out and we need to get round a table with this brutal tyranny. And we need people of exceptional brilliance to engage with the Kremlin. And that should have been happening for some time. It's perfectly possible to have two conversations at the same point. It's perfectly possible to be helping Ukraine and also talking to Russia. I fully understand that it's not possible for Russia and Ukraine to sit down together because Russia's understanding of any form of negotiation is capitulation to its whim and that no right-minded country would possibly countenance. But there must be a route forward. There always is. It's a matter of finding it. I don't think we're looking and I don't think we're using all the resources that are available to us.